That's the yellow bar. And the black one is, it asks principals, how much influence over these decisions do principals have? And these are, you know, these aren't all the key issues in a building. These are important ones from deciding on school budget, evaluating teachers, hiring teachers, determining faculty and professional development, setting school discipline policy. Watch that one. That's an important one. Uh, setting school performance standards, establishing the school curriculum. Now this is a typical picture. You notice a huge difference between the dark bars and the light bars. Principals, it's not that they're, you know, they're constrained too, but principals have far more decision-making power in the typical school, elementary, secondary in this country. This is not a new thing. These data are from 2015-16, uh, but, you know, I've, I've run these data back for, the, you know, 30 years. It's a top-down model in many cases that administration does the managing and makes decisions and teachers carry out those decisions. Okay? So what? Maybe that's, maybe that's fine. You know, having sat in long faculty meetings, it is efficient if one person just decides and we don't have a three-hour argument over it. Okay, efficient, the principal decides. But what if the principal makes a decision that none of the faculty agree with? Then that's a problem. Okay. So we did a whole analysis. We looked at different schools because it turns out these are averages, but schools vary dramatically, private and public also, on just how much voice do teachers have. And so we wanted to look at in buildings in which there's more or less voice, what's the uh, turnover of teachers in those buildings? So these were advanced statistical analyses where you know you control for the characteristics of teachers, you control for the characteristics of schools. Poverty, size, urban, urban, suburban, uh, urban, rural, suburban, etc. Net of that, does this voice issue have any bearing? And yes, it does. And I try to capture that with this slide. So horizontal graph is overall how much input. This get national survey data, schools and staffing survey. How much input does the teachers on average have in the building over a bunch of decisions? That's the horizontal. The vertical one, what's the percentage of voluntary, so we're not including retirement here, voluntary departures from the building, turnover of teachers. So, buildings in which faculty have very little decision making say, they're going to average across the nation almost 20% voluntary quits per year. On the other hand, buildings in which teachers have a whole lot of say, they're down there at less than 5% turnover a year. That's what in my business we call strong funding. <coughs> and this is controlling for stuff. These are correlations. Can't talk causality here. Peter. Hey, to the causality, where you've been telling the story, sort of the implication that when we give teachers more agency, that's going to reduce turnover? Yes. Yeah. And that's oversimplified on my part. Sure. To, to, for the narrative, but is it reasonable also to think that those are turned around? That when you have a more stable base, you can then, because if I have somebody new to my school, I don't want to, yes. I want them to acclimate. I don't want to give them a lot of. That's a great question. Maybe it's the reverse. Maybe a building where there's low teacher turnover, more say is delegated to the teachers. That could be the case. Can't say which way the arrow of causality goes here. Now I did do some field work in the study too, where I went into schools and you know talked to people about this stuff and sort of asked them a series of questions, how much say they had, and then get the turnover rates and blah blah blah. And there seemed to be this issue where um, the affluent suburban schools that had very little teacher turnover. They actually were unhappy with the amount of, they had more decision-making influence, but they're unhappy with it. I don't want to say they were spoiled. They were sort of like, you know, we don't have enough set. So they sort of muddied the waters. You're asking a great question. And all we can establish here is a correlation. But the field work seemed to suggest that if you did this, you got that sort of thing. If you gave more voice, you'd have better retention. But really, I can't state that with any certainty. All right, so that's a step. Ed, 
Yeah, I think there's some evidence that Peter might be on to something. Does it, you know, I worked for Center for Teacher for Quality and we did these statewide surveys and we asked similar questions on those surveys as SAS on, you know, do you want involvement in decision making on X, Y, and Z? We also, well, do you get, do you have decision making on X, Y, and Z? Well, we asked a second set of questions in Alabama. Do you want to be involved in decision making on X, Y, and Z? And they didn't always say that they wanted it particularly beginning teachers because they were just trying to swim and they didn't want to get enmeshed in all the other they just like let me teach for a year and figure it out so it, it, it I this think is there's an excellent something point. going on there and the assumption isn't that all these teachers want right. to be involved with decision making particularly if it involves lots of after school meetings right. so beginners may not like they're just trying to survive and there's other teachers where look I just want to do my nine to three and I don't care so yes, but that's true, you know, in higher ed, your good faculty are going to be mixed as to what extent they want to have a voice. We have found in the field work, though, that if the teachers are really riled up about something, if there's some policy that's come down the pike which is making life hard for them, then they want to have a voice. <laughs> yes, but otherwise they may not care. So you're, you're on to a good point, and that can maybe muddy this a little too. We, we were just struck at how sharp that decrease was. I was sort of surprised. I didn't expect it to be that sharp. So then I'll finish by talking about a second study with a different, large scale, but different database. It's called TELL, T-E-L-L. -L. And uh, across 16 states, it was started in North Carolina a couple decades ago. TELL stands for teaching empowering, leading, and learning, or something like that. It's a wonderful sort of climate survey. They get a very large percentage of the teachers in the building to respond to it. It's like a diagnostic tool. It's really an excellent source of data. And what it had that the earlier data didn't have is <coughs> test scores. Because I was so interested in this question. If you give teachers more voice, does it make a hill of beans of difference for student test scores? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's just a nice thing and it helps their retention. But is it connected to student test scores on the state tests? I was just dying to analyze this, and these tell data allow us to do this. And so we had two outcomes. We had all this data. Typically, you get 90% of the teachers in the building to fill it out. And all these questions on, you know, what's the role of teachers? How much input do teachers have in this issue, in that issue? You know, similar to that prior data set, the schools and staffing survey, but a whole different data set. So I wonder, well, will it be consistent with our earlier findings or not? And does it make any difference? Does it have any correlation with test scores? So we did these advanced statistical analyses, you know, controlling for everything we could, type of school, size of school, percentage of beginning teachers in the staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we found, interesting enough, very strong positive effects on both of those outcomes. Buildings in which teachers have more voice have significantly better teacher retention and significantly better student test scores. Back to Peter's point, I can't say causality. I can't, this is correlation. I can't say that if you do this, you'll get that. No. I can just say that where there's this, there's also this for a very strong likelihood. And you know, maybe there's a reverse causality, and I want I'm gonna pick Peter's brain after this to sort of how can we start to chip away at that? And I have a slide here just to show this. Let me try to explain this slide. I hope it's not too complicated. So we took the schools and we divided them into deciles according to overall teacher voice on a series of different issues. And so lowest teacher decision making, TDM, that's the bottom decile, bottom 10%. And on average, uh, teachers were asked, what are your immediate plans? And the answers were, stay in this school, get the heck out as soon as I can, a whole series of answers. And 76%, so this isn't actual turnover, this is your intentions. 76% on average say that they want to stick around in the buildings that had the lowest levels of teacher voice. On the other hand, the buildings that had the highest levels, the bottom bar, 87% said they wanted to stick around. Now that's an 11 
percentage point difference that's statistically significant. In other words, in buildings, and again, these are you know multivariate analysis. We're controlling for things in buildings in which there's more teacher voice. In this case, uh, significantly better plans to stick around, which is consistent with the other data set. That was so interesting to me because you know if it had totally contradicted my earlier research. Uh, I don't know what one does. You go back to the drawing board. Something's wrong here. I have two data sets that are saying opposite things. You know, this is what you need to do to sort of figure out. In this case, they're highly consistent. And then I'm going to end with this final finding, and I want to pick your brains on it. Okay. In both of these analyses, the schools and staffing survey and also this TEL survey, uh, teacher voice, the outcomes are teacher turnover, teacher retention, student test scores. In both data sets, one area of decision making rose above all the others as the most important one, the best bang for buck, so to speak. In other words, you give teachers say over this issue, you get far better outcome. Both databases. And what was that area of decision making? Teachers say into student discipline and behavioral issues. It trumped everything. Buildings in which teachers had more say, and this it's non-academic, student behavioral and discipline policies and procedures. You give teachers voice into that, those buildings had significantly better turnover, significantly better test scores in both databases. Why? Why is it, I'm, I'm looking for answers, folks. This is a question. <laughs> Why is it that giving teachers over the discipline behavioral policies and procedures seems to be such an important thing for teachers. I mean, think of this. Teachers' input into tests and texts and teaching techniques, that was also positively correlated with test scores. You get teachers more say in those things, better test scores. But that was trumped overwhelmingly by teacher input into the non-instructional non stuff, student discipline stuff. That seemed to be the key one. Why is that so important? Help us out. Did you really disaggregate that by the race of the teacher? <sighs> yes, we did some. I can't quite remember. In many cases, we aggregated it to the school level. But we would have something like percentage of faculty that are minority or something like that. Uh, I can't exactly remember, but it wasn't a big factor there in this. We control for it, but regardless, of, like we looked at different subsets of schools to see if this relationship still happened. Like if you take high poverty schools, do you still find this strong positive effect between input into discipline and behavior stuff and these outcomes? And you did. High minority schools, urban schools, we did that because we're so interested in both data sets had this finding, is it robust? Is it all schools? Because it just seems so interesting. So why might, yes? Diane Mogger at Policy Center. And I've been walking around in the rural schools for a long time, and school climate is my specific specialty. And we've been analyzing the offshoot of the TEL survey that South Carolina has for the last 15 years. And um, one of the other questions on that TEL survey that I think is really significant that I wanted you to try to tell me why nobody's paying any attention to it is that you ask teachers, if you were to think about leaving, what would be the reasons that you would leave? Okay. And the number one in all the states I was looking at was principal administration. And when we work in schools and student behavior for the magnet schools were evaluating and everything, on our surveys, it's student behavior, student behavior, student behavior. Same thing. And what we find is that the teachers really don't believe that that administration is doing a good job or that the principal is hearing them. I've actually been in the meetings where the teachers talk about this and the mental health issues and everything. And the principal says, well, you know, the district won't give us any more money. The teachers think that in the schools where I go, they could do a much better job because their administration is not handling it for them. And this whole issue of leadership in connection with the retention issue, I find not enough information out there, and I think it's much more critical 
And I think that some of the policies that we have, if we focused more on support and mentoring and training of principals, we could keep more teachers. All right. That's my bias, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I hear you saying that teachers' dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with administration is a big finding, and then within that, it's often dissatisfaction with the policies, the rules, the sanctions, or whatever, having to do with student behavior and discipline. Because it affects their classroom. Right. right. Yeah. And so teachers want more voice in that. I think you're saying yes. you're providing. And yes. so you're making an argument supporting this finding that this is just a key thing for teachers. Yeah. And somehow it's tied to better test scores by those students. Well, and we find, you know, when we over and over again, that um, schools with stronger working conditions, more positive, we've done cluster analysis and everything, have much higher student outcomes and a variety of indicators. Yes. So, and teacher retention and principal retention. Yes. But I'm curious as to why none of the assemblies that I've ever worked with in the states want to deal with the whole issue of principals. They'd rather put more money into the pipeline, more money into retention, more money into mentoring, and they keep skipping over the fact that in rural schools, usually the principals that get placed there are the ones that are least experienced. Or they have been tossed from a higher performing school <coughs> for non-performance, and they get hired to run the lowest performing schools in the state. And, and I would add to that, you know, not in Diane's, um, you know, terms, but those principals who are uh, sort of lower performing principals have no idea how to help their teachers That's right. and support their teachers or even involve <coughs> their teachers in how to deal with very difficult student behavior and discipline issues that are getting worse and worse over time as we have a sort yes. of mental health you know, crisis that's happening. Our student you know, so I'm a practitioner, and our student behaviors are becoming extreme, not only at the middle school and high school, but going down into, you know, second grade. And so, so, that's a nice, so that's major. Right. I mean, what you're saying is that teachers having some voice in these behavioral issues is key for them. Or how to get help, yes. or what they can do. What kind of help they can get. Yes. And that it maybe has these ripple effects even in terms of test scores. Oh, yes. You can't get good test scores when you have chaos. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also, I think I heard you say that the quality of leadership varies, and that your, your, your hypothesis is that rural schools may have lower quality school administration yes. leadership. Yes. And that'd be an interesting thing to look at. I mean, that's one of the themes of yes. this whole project with Henry is sort of rural schools and. Uh, resources and the quality of things and whether there's an inequity, there's an equity issue there, along with sort of the metrocentric type of thing. Yes? So um, I have a noise project with Dr. Yao and we've been studying rural teachers for about five years now and we do more smaller qualitative studies but this res your whole talk resonates with me with what, what we hear from them. Yep. But a lot of them say, you know, they want to teach math, I do math or science teachers, they want to teach their content, but if the administrator, that they send a student out, they're getting the student thrown back in their classroom again with nothing. So they, they feel a loss of control and they can't teach their content. And so those are the teachers that are leaving their schools and finding other schools where there's stronger administrator support. Okay, so the teachers feel really stressed out about the behavioral issues. And that's having a negative impact on the content teaching, and that's having a negative impact on test scores, and also a negative impact on retention. I kind of like that. I kind of like that theory. Yes. You know, going back to Peter's question, I also wonder to what extent does this student misbehavior get misconstrued, or cultural Thank conflicts get misconstrued? Thank you. Student behavior. So even with this key of key finding, you know, teacher influence over student behavior and discipline policy has the strongest impact on both student yeah. achievement and teacher turnover and retention. That's all fine and dandy, but if 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 we have teachers who are doing the wrong things by students, do we want to retain them, right? Or do we want to educate them on how better able to meet the needs of the students that they're called to serve? Excellent point. Mm -hmm. If you give teachers more voice in student discipline, 
it doesn't necessarily mean right. that it's going to be good. Right. 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 It might not be intelligent, uh, you know, uh, discipline policies. Right. Yes. Right. You empower employees, and that can go in different directions. Right. And I don't really have data on that. You know, I mean, we're controlling for poverty levels, et cetera, of the students in this analysis. But, but I'm not, I, I can only go really, so far with that. that right, That's, even that doesn't, so even if you're talking about high poverty schools or you're talking about uh, urban schools, this, the teaching force is still overwhelmingly white, right? That's and right. so if we're talking about student misbehavior, again, it can be misconstrued as cultural. I mean, cultural conflicts can be misconstrued as misbehavior because there may be a disconnect between the students they're called to teach and who's serving in a particular role, right? So, so the, the, the question, going back to what Peter asked, about the race of the teachers and all of those things, I, I think is, is important to consider, right? Yeah. Yes. So, well, and not just the race, the, the critical consciousness of the educator, right? right? Yes. So if I had data on percent minority faculty in the building, your prediction, your hypothesis, I think, is that there might be different levels of reporting of the extent of say in student discipline issues. I need to sort of think this through. Can, yes. There's also the additive of, we know this from the research base, that students that are Latinx, African American, Asian, in regardless of school type, are over policed inside of the school district, and they're going to receive more disciplinary action regardless of the makeup of the school district. So, yeah. so one is one way to do this is to possibly create like an indices to capture the relationship of policy to the incidence of over policing in that school, right? So that's one thing that can be done that when you throw it into the model can lead toward this causality that we're getting at, but making those types of indices aren't yes. that straightforward, especially yeah. when we're talking about policies. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, this is just how much say did the faculty have over these issues, you, t you take that measure, and then does it correlate in these models with these outcomes, and it doesn't unpack those types of nuanced issues. Yes. I was just going to say that interestingly enough, we also find that <coughs> students say that there's too much misbehavior in their, these same schools, that they agree with the teachers, that there's a discipline issue. Yes. So, and how the discipline is dealt with, yes. no measures of that, and that could be, you know, that could be good, bad, all, all, everything in between. Which brings up this just points. captures, do the teachers, how much say do they have in these policies or not? Not yeah. what do they say. Right. Yeah. And when they have more say, somehow you have these more positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Richard, we could also make it, so building on Daniel's point, we could make it further more positive if we educate the teachers and the administrators about you know, bringing them the critical consciousness and then give them the power, once they've been educated on the matter, to distinguish between, oh, this is, you know, this is a, uh, a truly disciplinary action versus this is a disciplinary action that's maybe cultural differences between us. Yes. See, that's where, you know, sort of quantitative analysis of large-scale survey data questionnaires can only take it so far. Like some of these questions, it would be sort of wonderful to have some field work that would take that and unpack all these nuances that we can only sort of scratch the surface. That's where sometimes a combination of quantitative and qualitative, I think, makes such a great case. Of course, it's very time consuming to do puzzle. <laughs> I'm going to need some of your help, by the way. So, you know, <laughs> yes. Richard, Ed, Ed. Yeah, I think along these lines, I think with the temple data and given if you took the, because it was the same as the CTQ data. Mm -hmm. um, if you took the schools with really high response rates, they asked the teachers what their race is. You know what the race of the students are in the school because you can match it with state administrative data. I think, and then with those individual questions, and I think the civil rights data has disciplinary data in it. But yes, I don't know, it does. I think you can start to disentangle some of these things looking at the race of the teacher, the race of the student, and 
It could be and what, and their perceptions about the school. So if you can do by teacher, you have the teacher level data. Just yes. Like within the school variation, and the teachers of color perceive this in a different way than the, than the white teacher. Yeah. yeah, you can do that. I mean, that'd be a quick solution with the data you have available. Yeah. Okay, but the thing is, our outcomes are school wide. They're aggregated. So it's school level student test scores. So, you know, I, we have data on the individual race of the teacher and then also a percentage of teachers' ability, for instance, are minority. We have those. But then you've got the school level aggregate measure of test scores. So. You aggregate everything up to the school level, though, right? Right. Okay. That's what we're doing in this analysis. It's aggregated to the school level and just control for these other school characters. Anyhow, you know, this is something maybe pick your brain a little bit. Because it's starting to get into the weeds and I have to think. This is complicated. Yes. Other, other thoughts or questions? Yes. I'd just like to pick up on Diane's earlier statement about her work. You, you were talking about disciplinary issues and behavioral issues, but you really jumped to the quality of the principal as a whole. I'm not sure you were just focused on the behavior issues. No. What other issues were are relevant in your work? Um, in that particular factor structure, the issues of teacher voice and the extent to which they feel that they have uh, the support of the administration, basically the administration has my back. The trust issue is a really critical one in working conditions. And there are questions on there about the extent to which they're involved in planning and in decision making at the school. And so it's a constellation of all of those kind of factors that you've been talking about. Um, we started out with an interest in trust and then sort of morphed into the um, working conditions. Because I would go out and try to collect data in schools and we would leave surveys there to be passed out and they would send them back to us and we would find some came back with multiple layers of duct tape on them and staples because they were afraid the principals were going to open it before it came back to us in the big envelope. And so we started looking at this whole issue of trust and then we got into the working conditions and climate. And it's just become really critical in looking at the success of the schools and when Jen Morrison here was at the State Department. We work with folks that are working with the lowest performing schools. And we've been helping them track progress and change on climate and the relationship between that and uh, school achievement. And it's pretty striking. Um, so, yeah. It's, I think it all fits together. Yeah, I was gonna, along those lines, so when I did the data analysis for CTQ, the, and we did teacher, we did teachers intent to leave, which right. Sunny Lab found to be pretty accurate indicators of whether they actually do leave. Yeah. That that question on there that teachers' perceptions of uh, what was it, uh, an atmosphere of trust and respect in the yes. school yes. always was like the, the the strongest predictor of whether a right. teacher wanted to stay. In a that teacher school. and teacher morale. Yeah. The staff and teacher morale is high at our school. And those are all in the working conditions factor. And the factor has stayed stable for 15 years in South Carolina. Hi. Um, I'm Jane Turner. I'm the director of the Center for Educator Recruitment, Retention, and Advancement here in South Carolina. Just, you'll know where I'm coming from. But I just had an interesting thought. We've had a lot of thoughts about all these, all the comments we have that I that we, I've talked to several various ones of you about over the years. But I just had a thought that what bothers me a lot of times about surveys is how we define the terms and how those who are answering the questions define the term. And their answer could be different depending on their perception of what the question is really asking. And especially in terms of teacher departures, what I just start sitting here thinking about is when a teacher says they left because they were dissatisfied or they didn't have administrative support, I'd be curious to know what the principal thought the reason for the teacher leaving was. Because from the principal's point of view, it could be because the principal was pressuring the teacher to perform more effectively. But from the teacher's point of view in answering that question, it's just lack of support, 
unfairness, personality conflict, whatever it might be. So I don't know if that's anything that's ever worth pursuing, but that's just what struck me. Is I'd love to know sometimes what the principal would say about why a teacher left. And, I, and there's going to be misperceptions on both sides, and chances are a lot of times that wouldn't match. And I think that would be interesting to know as well, especially in terms of quality of administration. I think it does when you think about principal support. Mm -hmm. Principal support around discipline. All right, so you have sort of this idea of, I write this kid up, and the principal does something about it. But then there's this other way of thinking about it, is this, this principal understands cultural competence, yes. understands the need for those things, right. mm -hmm. and is able to support the faculty in making decisions around student behavior in the context of that cultural competence. And uh, right now, traditionally, so I just sat in a personnel meeting, and this week it was right to, you know, where the teacher said for three hours, this principal is not supporting me, the principal is not supporting me, the principal is not supporting me. And the principal was listing all these ways in that the support was actually happening. But what the teacher meant was, I, gave, I did 52 referrals this year so far, <laughs> and you guys haven't done anything about it. You know, you principal haven't done anything about it. So it doesn't even get into this realm of this. So when Dr. Tran sort of making this connection of, you know, if you talk about the level of cultural competence in a school and the level of teacher say, and how do those two things then affect reduced retention and increased achievement? It is a subtle you know, kind of thing, but you, you have to look at all of that. Because just straight up support is defined very differently, probably, by teachers and principals. Let me go back to your point. So, you're absolutely right that self-report data, why do you leave a job, regardless of the industry, that's going to be very subjective. And, you know, it could be dishonest or whatever, and it's the worst case, where you, you were fired and you're claiming, well, I left because these people were unfair. Mm -hmm. So self-report data have that limitation. But we have two types of data analyses here on, say, turnover. So we've got Teachers are asked, and they list their reasons, and I have some of those slides. They put down you know, lack of administrative support. So that's self-report data. <coughs> but we also did a thing where we took school working conditions, which, you know, based on the reports of all the teachers, and looked at, are they correlated with likelihood of teachers uh, leaving or not? So then that's a whole different thing, trying to get at the reasons. Two different types of data, two different types of analyses. One is just descriptive self-report, you know, frequencies that said this, that, and the other one is multivariate analysis, you're looking at correlations after controlling for types of schools. Mm -hmm. And the power is where the two maybe are consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one place they were consistent was this whole issue of voice. You know, the voice may go in a good direction or a bad direction, but voice somehow seems to, seems to, have, seems to be correlated with positive things. Uh, the voice, maybe it's an ugly voice, I don't know, but it's, there's a thing there. So that's where, you know, again, different types of analyses to try to, are our findings consistent sort of thing? There's two other nuances about voice that I've been thinking about since listening today. One is there's a subtle difference between a teacher having a voice and having an opportunity to have a voice. Yes. Like you said, not every teacher wants to be on the student discipline policy committee. Yes. But they like to know that they could have an opportunity to be if they wanted. And that they'd be heard. Yes. Well, that's the other part. It's not just being heard. It's also being told, like the communication. Like a lot of teachers' dissatisfaction with support over student discipline is because nobody told them what actually happened to the student. Like, and they think nothing happened to the student, when in fact, three things did happen, but nobody is explaining it to them, or they didn't have a role in setting the policy that describes what those three things are. Yes. So all of that is... All of that nuance is utterly masked in a survey question that says, you know, how much input did the faculty at your school have over student discipline and behavioral policies? It doesn't. 
it doesn't get any of those nuances. That's where field work would really be valuable, mm -hmm. to sort of flesh that out. All I can show is what are the levels and what are the correlations. But you're raising a big point about, you know, what is voice? The one thing it's not is what's in the literature sometimes called window dressing. That is, you're on some committee, it meets for hours, you make a decision, and then it's ignored and you realize, you know, the board made the decision three months ago and we're just window dressing. This is just sort of a charade. That's, corporate sector has figured out that don't do that. It's better just to give no voice to the employees than sort of this fake voice where they're sort of being co-opted. Now, it's interesting on this voice issue, I found this out that there's several states. Come on. Oh, no. Why does it do that? There's several states now that have mandated that each school have a building level team or council that actually has authority for decision making. The principal is on this council, but so are teachers. And it's interesting, I read some of the statute, the, the legislation, and it says, this is not advisory, this has decision making authority, and it actually listed areas. Which is sort of a legislative uh, empowering teacher initiative. I mean, I'd love to see, and I've only found six states thus far that are doing it. I don't have no idea about South Carolina, but. I mean, it'd be interesting to see how this comes out. Does it bear fruit? What happens to it? Where there's going to be a council in that school. We're demanding it as a legislature. It's going to have authority to make X decisions. And teachers can outvote the principal. I mean, think of that. If this is really a switch in power. I'd be curious to you know, figure out those types of things. I mean, that's interesting. Was discipline policy on the list of some of these things? I think so. I'd have to go back. You know, reading the statutes is really... <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't remember, but I should know the answer to that. Uh, that's interesting. And then the other one I want to mention, this is sort of a bias of mine. There's this small but growing movement. This is so unusual. I never came across... This what didn't exist when I was a teacher. Mostly charter, but not entirely. It's teacher-run schools. It, they model themselves after law firms, where the law partners, it's their firm, they own it, they run it, they make the decisions, they hire, they decide uh, salary and everything. And so there's this model, they're mostly in the Midwest, of teacher-run schools, where you know, you'll have some committee or council and they make all the decisions. Of course, they're in an environment of testing and accountability. It's a very interesting model. I visited a couple of these places. You know, of course, there's meeting time. You're going to have a council or committee making decisions. One of the interesting things is when the teachers call the shots, there's been some research on these places, the curriculum slowly but surely changes towards sort of a student-centric direction and kind of inquiry learning. It's very interesting when the teachers make the decisions. It's sort of the curriculum actually goes in this sort of very progressive kind of model. It's, it's just an interesting, it's, it's the most... From an organizational, you know, it's the most sort of professionalized model I've ever seen. And it's, you know, similar in higher ed where professors, depending on the university, often have a heck of a lot of decision-making influence, far more than, you know, high schools and elementary schools. And this model is just so interesting. I list it on the bottom. They even have a web page. So that's just sort of my, it's just, a, it's just a fascinating model to me. I would have loved that when I was a teacher to find such a place, but I don't think they, they didn't exist back then. That's interesting. And people are often aghast. Teachers running schools? I mean, God, who ever thought of that? Well, lawyers run law firms. Engineers have, you know, their partnerships, etc. Accountants, you know. And there was professionals, this is a hallmark of professions, is that they have a lot of voice, for good or bad. So it's just an interesting model. I want to see research done on it to see, because, you know, there's got to be some pitfall, you know, interesting. Who else? Any other questions or reactions or hypotheses for me to explain some of these findings? I was, I was going back to your original question and I had a hypothesis that it could, might be totally bullshit, but it'd be interesting to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking about like why, I was trying to think about why discipline was coming up as number one as opposed to curriculum and instruction, which is what you do day in and day out. Yes. I can't do it. You can't do it. I've got a couple of salts of it. I mean, honestly, I think we know why. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Let me see if this holds any water. I was thinking as a teacher, if you involve me in a curricular decision, you're valuing my intellectual and professional contribution. Right? So I feel validated in that way. When I think about discipline issues, usually at, by the time something becomes an issue, it's a threat. It, there, there's some sort of confrontation. I've had my authority challenged, and it becomes uh, like, it, I mean, it could be physical safety, but I think it, it, it might be like professional safety. So when we think of something as it's sort of like Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy, from a professional standpoint, I would think that intellectual contribution would be higher on the list, it would be, it would be less critical to have than sort of protecting my professional safety, which is sort of my authority as a, as a teacher in a classroom and having that backing and, and you got to talk about trust. I think that's critical to have that trust. So I like this. Yeah. I think there's like a commentary effect though, right? So like the teachers themselves want to have agency over their classroom, right? right? And they want to be able to dictate what happens within that like literal force base, right? The, the challenge is, however, that starting before NCLB, but really like taking off at NCLB, that agency was stripped away. And the increased pressure from administrators for them to produce, right, in whatever manner that is dictated by the district or by the policy at a federal, state, or local level or by the principal itself, puts extra added benefit on them to use racialized policies or discriminatory policies to kick those students out. Yeah. So it's yeah. the only way that they can actually reclaim their agency. Your curriculum, your pedagogy, your classroom is completely dictated by everything around you. The only thing you have say in is that this is how you're gonna enact these types of discipline policies, right? And that, that's like something that to, I think, think about when we think about the entire structure of discipline and how we're approaching discipline both on a localized level, but approaching discipline from like big data set, right? Big data sets and on a systematic level and thinking about how these problems trickle down into the classroom to create what we see. Um, and I think, you know, we've stuck to this point for a reason, right? Like interesting questions beget more interesting questions and more interesting things that everybody could go home and think about. And, uh, internally, I'm thinking about conversations that we've had in the department as a unit, and I, in one instance, I've hyper-focused on these, this like discipline challenge in one specific district, and sometimes I feel a little bit odd about it because maybe it's perceived as, well, why is he hyper-focusing on this? Discipline is a fascinating thing because the more minutes of time you lose on curriculum and pedagogy, we know that you're... Um, that your achievement metrics are going to go down. Those achievement metrics, we all know, are problematic for their own reasons, right? But the achievement metrics that we use currently for those students are going to go down. And if we also know that students of color and marginalized students and students of high poverty are going to be disciplined more, then we need to pinpoint why they're being disciplined more and how we can sort of mitigate um, those policies. We're talking in urban schools, by the way, it's one of my deals. In urban schools, we're, we're talking about haircuts and gym shoes and colors and, you know, people are getting, people are dropping out of school because they're getting too many demerits on a pair of Jordans yeah, that they're refusing. Particularly in charter schools where there's a bunch of those types of Right, things. and then we get the cream skimming effect. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So your <coughs> hypothesis might be that, okay, teachers have a lot of voice and there's a lot of draconian and strict policies and that may be leads to some kids dropping out or being kicked out, and hence scores up. Or am I? Is that? Is yeah, that that's, part, that's one of the. Is the, that a counter explanation of that finding? Yeah, that's one of them, right? Because if if you go back to one of your earlier slides too, that you had agency on there, right? Like the teacher's ability to make their own thing, and that was also, it's one of the things that they talk about. I mean, it's, yes. And so your finding is very important. Good work, yeah. by the way. I think it's how we interpret the findings, right? You know what the reader does with that finding is is also of utmost importance, right? Yes. Which is why I'm glad we're having this conversation because somebody can look at that and say, we just need to give teachers more voice, right? And allow them. But I, I like what Henry said and some others said about no, it means that perhaps we need to really think about, you know, what are our discipline policies? How are they marginalizing students? Is it really a discipline issue or is it are they cultural conflicts? And do we need to better prepare ourselves to be more critically conscious? And that's you know. You know, do we need to prepare teachers better? Do we need to prepare principals better? And do principals need to, you know, lead their staff 
uh, and, and engaging in more equity focused disciplinary practices, right? So it's the implications in my in my in my opinion that's yeah. that's about most important. Right? I mean, we were just we were just struck at the strength of that finding, and then two separate databases find it. What to make of it? Right. We're a little unclear. Yeah. We're sort of a little bit foggy on what to make of it, how to interpret it. You've given me some alternative interpretations. I want to sort of go back in the data and see which things can I get a uh, you know an angle at a little bit. What's in the database? I have to think about that because it's just such a strong finding. But we weren't quite sure how to interpret it. That's why I asked. <laughs> so yes. Uh, who else? Just yes. Add one extra point, following up on what David had to say. Um, when we saw this relationship with some of the, we were looking at relationships between the working conditions and climate with some of the outcome variables on our report cards, and we were looking at the discipline because we saw this discipline stuff. Let's look at our data and see if there's any correlation there. Well, unfortunately, um, there are incentives for schools not to report everything. And so if you have, or that you might report it in one category, but someone else is calling it another one of the 120 categories that you can put into the power school system. And so what happens is that we can't validate with real data anything here because we've had to totally ignore ever using the, the data on either serious crimes or minor crimes in the state because there's no consistent way of coding those in the system and getting them back out. And the civil rights data is the same way. Um, so we just have a lot of problems getting validity on any of those metrics. Yes, this is not a new issue. Yeah, I know. <coughs> Suspension rates, data, mm -hmm. there's so many issues and problems. That's right, that's right. And it's hard to know what to make of, and there's big validity, reliability issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, in this case, teachers, it's not, it's not amount of discipline, it's just how much say do teachers have in it? Whatever that say is. Right, yes. Well, yes. I, think, I think that gets tough because when you start talking about a, a fight or an incident, um, how are you going to code that in power school? Right. Is that going to be one incident right. with multiple players? Exactly. Or if that is written up, well, you did this, you did this, you did this, then it was written up as four or five referrals that may not be going in one incident. Right. So it would create Exactly. I think a lot of times too, teachers want to know because I think they are rule followers. Yes. And they want to know where that boundary is, and they want to know that they are being supported by the administration. But what teachers don't see is that conference that took place in that office. They did have that conversation with that parent, and so in their mind, they've been wronged. When they get ready to fill out a survey, if they're thinking about one incident. And that's at the forefront of their mind when they're filling it out. They may go far more negative than what you see in the overall uh, discipline within the school. And so I think there is some, some errors that could be there. We always try to talk to our people and say, hey, look, think throughout the entire year. Don't think about one event. You know what I mean? Think, you know, longitudinally, so to speak. So I think that that, uh, that can certainly influence some of your data and uh, things of that nature. Now, Henry suggested I bring along the second study with the tell data where the students, I, anyhow, we wrote it up in this magazine. I've got copies here if you want one, sort of short, plain English, no regression models, etc. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like a copy, you're welcome. Uh, anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you.